optimism to the world, and we can see through this gathering that uh, people often say at the end of someone's life that light and love and beauty and joy continue long after someone has left this world, and I think that this is a testament to the truth of that that the beauty and love and life, optimism and joy that Liz brought to the world continues today and will for many years to come. As I knew her was someone, when I got called to the surgical floor for patients who were anxious or maybe not doing well and saw her, she was always so grateful. Thank you Rabbi so much for being here. Thank you for being a part of the team. Thank you for bringing love and light into the room. And, uh, and I, my response to her was most often, I'm only adding to it because I saw that it was already present in her. So uh, Liz, I wanna thank you for the joy and optimism and support that you often brought to me when I came to do some of the difficult work which I do and I was always buoyed up by your spirit and your grace, graciousness and your grace and, and your love which uh, came out into everyone who knew you. So <clears throat> we thank everyone for being here and I'd like you to take just a few seconds to uh, enter into your own hearts and uh, remember what she brought to each of you. Maybe one precious memory of who she was and what she brought into your life and make a commitment in her memory to continue to bring that into the world in your own practices. So we'll take a second. We thank you. Uh, one of my teachers in seminary said that uh, the words life stood for love, for inspiration, <clears throat> for faithfulness, and for enthusiasm. And those qualities never die. So um, I think that uh, life is a truth and death is an illusion. So may we all remember that in everything that we do. So I would like to call at this moment uh, Dolores and Terry, uh, the sisters of uh, Dr. Ryan, to say a few words in her honor. For joining us to celebrate the life of Elizabeth and Ryan Daddy. My name is Dolores, it's my sister Terry. And we had the wonderful privilege of having Elizabeth privilege of being sisters of Elizabeth for 68 years. Elizabeth was six Elizabeth was six in the family of seven children. She was a quiet girl but not shy. From the time Liz was a child to her last days with us, she lived life in the present enjoying every moment. Carpe diem was her motto. She had a zest for life despite many difficulties she endured throughout. Liz was adventurous and eager to try things. She was determined, serious, and totally committed to attaining her goals, even at a very young age. One of Liz's favorite childhood, one of Liz's favorite childhood pastimes was crabbing at her home in East Quag, Mile. Hardly a summer's day went by that she was not on our neighbor's dock with her crab net and bucket determined to get more blue more crabs, more crabs <laughs> than the previous day. Years later, we were the fabulous Ryan sisters living on the Upper East Side and having a blast. Oh, we're hitting you. Don't touch that. <laughs> I'm going to repeat that one. Years later, we were the fabulous Ryan sisters living on the Upper East Side having a blast. 
Liz was working the night shift at New York Hospital and during the day taking classes to get into medical school. She always was up for a good party. It was amazing she could carve out time to study. <laughs> Did we forget to mention she was daring and bold? Celebrating Terry's 70th birthday on Black Island. 50th. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> 50th, sorry. <laughs> One night we went to a bar that featured karaoke. And no sooner did we walk in the door than who was signing us up to say. The Ryanettes, as we were labeled by a brother in law. Oh, the Ryanettes, as we were labeled by a brother in law. <laughs> but what we le leaked in musical talent, Liz made up for in enthusiasm. <laughs> unbeknownst, unbeknownst to us, we learned that Liz is free. I'm sorry, let me move back. <laughs> unbeknownst to us, we learned that in Liz's free time, she was driving to Teterboro Airport to take flying lessons. She might have gotten as far as a solo flight, and it certainly prepared her for her years as Michael's co-pilot. Later, having established her, her medical career at Greenwich Hospital, she thought the stage was calling her with uh, an audition for theater productions in Greenwich. While the singing and the acting and the flying did not pan out, Elizabeth became one of the most incredible doctors. These are, these are just a few anecdotes of how Liz lived her life, but as most of us all know, Elizabeth was one of the most loveliest of women. She was smart, she was sweet, and she was beautiful. She loved people and had the nicest words for all. She was gracious and kind. Not being dealt the best cards <coughs> in the deck, Liz never complained. Even when we, her siblings, called her with our examples, seeking her medical advice, she listened and was so generous with her time and knowledge. Now to her love. <laughs> well, her love life was Michael. Their years together were too short, but Michael was the love of her life. They met, and we might say, it was love at first sight. She was smitten immediately. And Michael, we believe, <laughs> you were as well. Those were the happiest 14 years of her life. Michael, thank you. We will we'll miss, miss you, Elizabeth, forever. <coughs> I know that's difficult to do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Beautifully done. So I'd like to call up Dr. Gary Kalin and Grace. Are you coming with him or separately? <laughs> okay. Huh? I want to say that um, this event was started in the lobby of Greenwich Hospital three, maybe four months ago in a meeting with Grace Persetti and Dr. Gary and myself who came together and said, uh, Let's do something wonderful for Liz. And uh, all three of us said, we really hope this works. <laughs> so I think today, uh, all of you being here and the wonderful energy and joy and love in this space is uh, proof that uh, the leap that we took was heavenward. So, Gary? Thank you everybody for coming here today and uh, thank you to Lars and Terry. It's a tough act to follow. Okay. I feel that I've been blessed to have had the opportunity to work with Liz for over 30 years. I first met Liz when she joined our anesthesia practice in 1989. As a junior members of a very established group, we quickly bonded and developed a friendship which transcended the workplace. However, Liz was much more to me than merely a friend or coworker. 
She was like a sister who enriched my life with her spirit and beauty. We went through many high times and low times in our work and personal lives, and we were always there for each other. Liz ultimately found true happiness in her relationship with her husband, Michael, and in her passion to help others through her work with medical missions. As I was preparing these remarks and planning this event, I took out my phone and started calling colleagues who knew Liz in our early years at Greenwich Hospital. I was touched by the many kind words and stories that they had to relate about Liz, and everyone's presence here today is a testament to her character. Everyone loved Liz. I will always remember and be grateful for the day last April when Liz, Dolores, Grace, and I met for lunch at Liz's favorite restaurant, Two Georges in Boynton Beach, Florida. It was a beautiful sunny day, actually very much like today, and despite her recent medical struggles, Liz was in good spirits. We talked about old times at Greenwich Hospital, and we talked about the future. <clears throat> Liz was very excited about the new boat that she and Michael were awaiting. She was ready to begin a new endeavor as she was transitioning from co-pilot to co-captain. After lunch, we took pictures and said our goodbyes. What a shock when Michael called me two weeks later to tell me that Liz had passed. It's truly an honor to be speaking today as we gather to celebrate the life and career of Elizabeth Ryan. While I mourned at her passing, we are gathered here today not to mourn, but to celebrate the beauty of her spirit and to be grateful that Liz was and will be forever in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And uh, now Grace Bassetti, who's been my friend for a long, long time. Hello, everyone. The best thing about working in a hospital, especially this hospital, is the huge spectrum of people you get to know. This wonderful array of people has come together today to remember and honor Liz Ryan, to celebrate the ways she enriched our lives. She was many things to many people, of course. Wife, sister, colleague, doctor of course, partner, supervisor, teacher, and of course, friend. And if you were lucky enough to be both a colleague and a friend, as I was, you were doubly blessed. How does one quantify a person? Liz was so much more than the sum of her parts. As we all know, she was a woman of delightful personality, a physician of consummate skill, and a friend of immeasurable generosity. Once, many years ago, I roasted my own anesthesia department mining everyone for their quirks and idiosyncrasies. But I could not think of one single thing to poke fun at in Liz. <laughs> there truly wasn't anything, and that's the truth. Life presented Liz with multiple challenges, and she negotiated them all with quiet, dignified grace. If I had to choose one of Liz's attributes that was the most notable, it would be generosity. I could give so many examples, we might be here all day, so I'll mention just a few. One spring, I mentioned I was planting flowers, and the next thing I knew, she delivered me a trunk full of impatience. She just said she had bought too many for herself. We would exchange gifts now and then, but I would give her a book or a pair of earrings and she would give me a Gucci purse. <laughs> she would brush it off saying she was a shopaholic and I was doing her a favor to let her get rid of it. <laughs> Our lockers were adjacent and we shared them. Of course, 
they were only four inches wide, so that's not saying a lot. <laughs> but we would go into each other's lockers and share our tricks to stay warm in the Arctic ORs. Silk underwear to wear under scrubs, ski socks to slide into clogs. Of the many nice things she did for me, by far the most thoughtful ever was last Christmas when I had the misfortune to suffer a detached retina, I was relegated to being prone 24 hours a day and I could not read. Being herself well acquainted with being housebound, she quietly got me a subscription to Audible Books. She never said anything, they just came by magic on my iPad. So even since April, I continue to get cheery messages from cyberspace or maybe heaven saying you have a book from Elizabeth Ryan. Liz joined the Greenwich Hospital family in 1989 and we promptly became friends. What I remember most about those early years <laughs> is always feeling secure if we were working together especially with the little ones. Fast forward to 2008, when I had the incredible privilege of going to El Salvador with Liz and the teams that she recruited to perform surgeries on children. It was somewhat intimidating for me. Imagine, for instance, giving anesthesia using an oxygen tank without a gauge. But with Liz in the next OR, that gave me the courage to do it. I learned on that trip that Liz spoke Spanish, another quiet skill she had that I didn't know about until then. There are so many fun memories of that trip too. Going to dinner despite our exhaustion at the end of those long, hot days in the crushing heat, then laughing so hard we could barely eat. The funniest moment of all was when we went through security at the airport. We were lugging monitors, electronic equipment, bulging bags of supplies and drugs, although no control drugs, those we purchased in El Salvador. Despite the exhaustive forms we had filled out and permits obtained, they pulled us aside and questioned us at length. They peered at the drug vials and said, que es esto? And we tried to answer truthfully, but remember they didn't speak English and we didn't speak much Spanish. So we resorted to saying, it's for the heart which they accepted. <laughs> but they kept asking for some list, which we did not have, until Liz finally triumphantly showed them her personal shopping list on a yellow pad, which said things like bathing suit and sweater. But it worked. They, pe they peered at it fixedly and waved us through. <laughs> Nostalgia is a powerful emotion, and on occasions like this one, we tend to look at the past through rose-colored glasses. But truly, all my memories of Liz are positive. I, I stayed overnight at her house on many occasions when it snowed, or maybe just after a late night out, because she lives so close to the hospital. The warmth was literal as well as figurative as we nestled by the fire, and she taught me to cook fish in parchment paper. <laughs> I remember getting manicures at Hilltop Nails in Glenville and giggling like schoolgirls, laughing so much we would smudge our nails and the ladies would scold us. I remember running to get coffee at Citarella when we were at the GI Center, somehow squeezing that in between 25 cases. <laughs> First Corinthians asks us, O oh death, where is thy sting? The sting will be when Michael goes flying but has to go without Liz as co-pilot. The sting will be when Ophi and Liz's sisters go on a cruise but have to go without her. The sting will be when we're putting a baby to sleep without her steadying hand. Yes, today is a celebration of life but it's also a time to say goodbye, which I really, really, really don't want to do. I am not a poet, 
So I'm going to borrow someone else's words, which I find comforting. Zoe Mulford puts it this way. There is an end to everything. The breath we take and the songs we sing. And the last note rings and dies away. But the song stays sung till the end of days. And every life's a brief, bright spark that dies and seems to leave no mark. So we curse the dark and mourn the flame, but the things it showed us still remain. And all we do may be undone, but the love stays loved and the song stays sung. Now, I don't know how Charles ended up there. <laughs> this. Uh, most of you here have known Liz much longer than I have known her. I came into her life 14 years ago and we met on an internet date and Liz was a pretty experienced dater back then <laughs> and I was not so she said if you want to meet me you have to take the train to Greenwich and I lived in Manhattan back then. So I took the train out, I think it was in February 2008, and it was a snowstorm. Um, I walked up to Figaro Restaurant on Greenwich Avenue. I don't think that exists anymore. Um, there was already four inches of snow on the ground, and as I walk in, they say, it's 8 o'clock, we're closing in 15 minutes because we have to make sure that the staff can get home. And Liz was sitting at the bar, and we had one glass of wine, and she asked me for my driver's license, I guess to make sure that I was really me. And then she pulled out a long list, I think there were 20 questions, we didn't get through, we didn't get through them all in 15 minutes, but I remember high up number three was something, do you floss? And I said, yes I do, I, I still do. Um, so then we decided to have a second date, and uh, then she drove into Manhattan to meet me. And I remember that, and of course I didn't know much about her, you know, 15 minutes, and I remember I was very impressed with her parallel parking skills. Because I watched her park, and you know Manhattan, how much, uh, you know, how tight it is, and she backed in, and it was perfect. We had a nice dinner, and I knew then that she was a very, very special person. Um, so we had a third date, and on the third date, she put me on blood pressure medicine. <laughs> and I didn't know, this was my third internet date, so I said, you know, I'm a doctor, maybe this is what happens. And, and then she said, you know, you should really see Joel Bloomberg and have your heart checked. <laughs> and I said, why? I ran the New York Marathon four years ago. I said, yeah, you know, you know, she's a very nice person. She, she just suggested these things. So I said, I wanted, you know, a fourth date. So I said, I'll go and see Joel. So, and by the way, when you see Joel, make sure he makes, that you have a full echo stress test. I said, what's that? Well, he'll tell you. So I have the stress test and Joel seemed very pleased. So he turned to me and said, Michael, your heart is much better than this ex husbands heart. <laughs> so I came home and I said, you know, he said, my heart is much better than your ex hearts Anyway, a few weeks passed and she said, do you have an ENT? And I said, oh, not really. She said, you know, maybe a good idea to check your hearing. Why don't you go and see, see Steve Saltz sitting right here? So I went to see Steve, and back then there was no problem at all. <laughs> so, um, and now we started to see each other on a regular basis. So a few weeks passes, and she says, how about your vision? <laughs> and I said, well, I think it's okay. And she said, why don't you go and have that checked out? So I saw Dr. Goya. And boy, I've never seen so many billing codes on the statement. Oh. <laughs> and uh, then I think month or two passes, everything, and I was madly in love, so I was happy to do all these things. And then she says, you know what, maybe you should see Neil Schamber. I 
and says, who is Neil and what does he do? <laughs> so she explained and she said, make sure to tell him to do an endoscopy too while he's at it. <laughs> All right, what I didn't know was that if you see Neil Chamber, you need to bring an anesthesiologist. <laughs> so Gary Kalen volunteered. So again, there was, there was nothing wrong. By now, I was a little bit suspicious. It was this on medical examinations, and I thought to myself, could this be some sort of a prenuptial <laughs> examination scheme she's doing? So then I think another, maybe a couple of months passed, and she said, I thought this was all over by now, and she said, you know, you should see Nick Strombakis. I said, who is Nick and what does he do? And she said, well, he will make sure everything is all right further down. I said, all right. Um, so I went to see Nick. And again, everything was fine. So then I proposed, and she said yes. <laughs> I will miss her for the rest of my life. She, she was just kind. She was just approachable. She was helpful. Lovely. She organized her functions in our party. She was someone that I saw, sort of saw her as our um, social network, or the person who really knew how to dress pro properly, always came in quite lovely. Um, our parties were always put together in a very um, lovely way. I recall one day that um, I received my first Lily Pulitzer dress from Liz. I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> I had no uh, idea what that was. And me being uh, new to Greenwich, I'm originally from Detroit, and then I was in New York, and uh, all of a sudden I'm on Greenwich Avenue, and I now know Lily Pulitzer. It's like, oh, this is, I'm moving up. <laughs> and I, I love that dress. And uh, another favorite, all-time favorite item from Liz is this, this lovely hat. I wish I, I, I had it, but I wear it all the time. And when I attend my uh, son's uh, athletic events, just as, as I came in with the big hat, I would wear that big hat that Liz gave me, and I love it. And uh, they actually hid it from me one year so that <laughs> uh, people would, would uh, that I wouldn't be so noticeable. And that's what kids do. But another thing that, <clears throat> um, it, it's just so nice to hear uh, all the things that her family shared, uh, our department, I mean, all of the, all those things are just so true and she just remains a person that I will always love and I will always appreciate. My uh, last uh, time that I call spending personal time with Liz was when I came to visit her in Rhode Island, um, her and Michael, and uh, we took the dog for a walk and we sat at the fire and had uh, lovely meals. And that's just the kind of person that she would she would invite you into her lovely uh, space, and you felt very comfortable there. And uh, I had nothing but plans to come see her again this summer. And um, she's is truly a delight. She's someone that I would say had a very strong uh, feminine energy and feminine power something that uh, <clears throat> as a young woman um, I appreciated that. Um, another quality of hers was her her quiet strength. This was uh, like she lived when I saw her I, I just admired her and I just appreciated uh, some of her uh, challenges, but what I remember most is, is really good times. 
that we share content together. I recall going out on her uh, kayak. I met her um, at Todd's Point in Greenwich. And I'm like, Liz, I'm on third call. I can't go out I'm on the kayak. She's like, oh, come on, Sarah. You could, <laughs> you'll be fine. We'll make it back. I'm like, Liz, I've never been on a kayak. <laughs> She's like, yeah. I'll leave you. No problem. We'll get back in time. I have to be back. And we went out on the kayak and uh, just had the most delightful time. And that's what she did. She, she would uh, introduce me to things and um, allow me to share. Uh, wonderful things with her. And uh, eventually I got called in, but we were already back <laughs> back on the, the beach. But uh, that was just some of the things and our bike rides and uh, when she uh, met uh, Michael, I remember her, her saying that uh, you have to kiss a lot of frogs. <laughs> but this one uh, was de definitely uh, uh, the, the prince. I was like, oh, how, how is that she would meet a guy with an airplane <laughs> that would take her and fly her to places like that? It was always like my fantasy to meet a guy with, with an airplane. <laughs> and she did it. I'm like, wow, that's great. And they were, uh, she was truly happy and truly uh, sensed her uh, joy and her love for Michael. So that's what I have to uh, share. Um, and also the fact that she was our uh, pediatric anesthesiologist uh, before we actually had trained pediatric anesthesiologists. Liz was that person that uh, uh, took on that great responsibility. And it wasn't until uh, I had my own children that I appreciated uh, the value and the importance of what she did and the love that she put into it. So I'll always uh, respect that, appreciate that, and she's someone that will always be a friend and that will always be with, with us and respect it within our department. So thank you. My name is Rick Beckerman, and uh, sometime in 2009, I was leaving the airport after landing my airplane. A young guy came up to me and he said, nice everything. I have one just like it. <laughs> and uh, we went and had lunch together and found out that we had something in common. We both met our wives online. <laughs> and from there, the friendship took over. And it was Mike and Liz and Rick and Laney. And we traveled first to Nantucket on a bike riding uh, sojourn. Where we, where we rode our bicycles to Stonson and back and fixed a couple of flat tires on the way and then flew to uh, Quebec City and then finally to uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. No, ours is smaller than that. Uh, there was a friendship between the two color, between the two couples. We were in South Carolina together meeting uh, Liz's sister. Uh, there was a bond. The last time I saw her was in Boynton Beach, and uh, this was on a cane. We had something in common. Uh, then I got the news from Michael. Uh, but there's living, and then there's living. There's living by staying alive and existing, and then there's living by enjoying your life and grabbing all the happiness that there is. And uh, Mike and Liz and Lainey and I are guilty of the latter. We enjoyed our time together, and it's always going to bring a smile to my face whenever I think of the times that we spent together. I'll be quick. Liz did buy me a pair of shoes once. <laughs> there were ice shoes from Costco, but they were very useful. <laughs> see that her middle name is Regina, which I didn't know for the longest time. Um, but when I found out, I started calling her my queen, which she would chuckle. She would call me her 
subject. <laughs> but, and it's ironic that Charles was here today, too. Um, but it's quite a royal name. And it comes with an expectation to live up to, and I think that Liz did that very well. She was always with a smile on her face, and she was definitely Greenwich Anesthesia royalty. When you look up royalty, you find several definitions. A diplomat, a head of state, someone who's successful. But the, the best one that fits Liz is a highly regarded member of a particular group. And that was Liz. She was regarded by everyone, the surgeons, the patients, the staff, never complained, always worked hard, always welcoming, made you feel at home. I first met her at one of these functions that she organized, it was a barbecue, and I had only two kids at that point. One was two years, one was two weeks. And the two-year-old was playing with a, a teenager named Peter McWhorter, who is now a general surgeon here at the hospital with three kids of his own. But Liz was always welcoming. Her tender touch with all the, the pediatric patients was wonderful to watch. She always made everyone in the OR feel relaxed. She took her show on the road internationally to take care of these unfortunate children. But she never bragged about it. She was always humble. Her willingness to always help out and her infectious smile made Liz the kind of person you want to grow up to be. And for that, she will always be royalty to me and fittingly, the queen of our hearts. Anyone else? <laughs> I couldn't leave an open microphone, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, I heard first about Liz when she came, uh, and I discovered 1989, which was not too long after I got here. Um, we discovered that we had a lot in common. Uh, we had both uh, become proud alumni of the New York Hospital Cornell Residency Training Program. So we spent our first several times together in the room um, laughing about the foibles of our shared professors, anesthesia professors, and surgical professors. Um, it never dawned on us, I'm sure, that given it was the infancy of our medical lives, uh, those professors were probably telling even funnier stories about the performances of, of Liz Ryan and Phil McWhorter uh, uh, during the training program. We had more in common. Um, she was kind, quiet, gentle, demure, and well, Liz was kind, quiet, gentleman. Uh, I could not, I could not approach her standard. Um, William Wordsworth said that uh, though nothing will bring back the hour of splendor in the grass and the glory of the flower, uh, we'll grieve not, uh, but take strength in what remains. Uh, when what remains of Liz? Well, Liz, like all the people in the operating room in my time, and I presume since I've been retired now a long time, um, all the people in the operating room are what I like to say are the little people. And I commonly say the little, because you're with the little people, it doesn't mean you're small. You can only make yourself small. But Liz was a little person, just like I was, Gary was, you know, Grace was, uh, Cassandra was, we all were. Uh, we knew early on that none of us were irreplaceable, uh, but we also knew in the time that we spent there that we were important cogs in the machine that made Department of Anesthesia, Department of Surgery, Greenwich Hospital, the people of, of the community of Greenwich, we made all those people go. Um, as many of you know, Liz wasn't without health issues uh, off and on throughout her life. Uh, and as any little person would, Liz would show up in the morning, she would do her job, hours, hours of boredom, punctuated by moments of abject terror, uh, take call that evening, come back the next morning, and do it all over again. Uh, and we could all, we could all, most of us do, uh, take lessons from that uh, behavior. Um, if I had to pick an epitaph to put on Liz's gravestone, 
it would be she tried. Uh, and I don't think any of us could ever aspire to ask for anything more than that. So Godspeed, Liz. Uh, we've been blessed by our time together. Thank you. story. Um, maybe the second time that I was in her presence, and this happens a lot in, in hospitals and medical institutions, she said to me, oh, where did you train? And I said, at NYU and at Hausenfeld, which those of you who know NYU, it's the pediatric hospital. And um, many people ask you after that, did you know? And were you there? When were you there? And, you know, other questions. And all she did was put her hand on mine and said, it's heartbreaking. And um, no one ever said that to me before. And it is heartbreaking. It's the babies and the children. And it's the sickest children who go to that hospital, probably in the world. And um, I just felt at that moment a person of such depth and heart and such empathy for me. And so it was my great pleasure to be a part of this today. And I always feel that when I do any celebration of life that, that a small miracle happens. And when we first were talking about the um, <clears throat> Oh, we should do this little memorial card which you can take with you. We thought about either flowers or a butterfly. That was what um, Grace and, and uh, the committee were talking about. I think it was Cassandra and Grace and I talking about should we put a butterfly at the top or should we put flowers on the side? And um, <clears throat> during Grace's uh, beautiful, beautiful tribute to her, Butterfly flew by, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which I rarely see in this space, by the way. So I felt um, very touched that she said, it's all right, MJ. I'll bring the butterfly. <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here and for bringing your love and your hearts and your memories to this incredible moment. And um, I hope that you'll join us for a conversation and for something sweet in her honor. Thank you. <laughs>